Well, we are in our last week of the series that I've been preaching here out of the book of Joshua. There's a whole lot more to the book of Joshua. Joshua is uh, a wonderful book. If you're looking for an interesting book in the Old Testament to read, um, Joshua is among the most interesting. Um, I love to read. You know, Genesis, of course, is great. Exodus is, is great all the time. I, I love Ruth. I love Esther. Um, I love those books as well. But Joshua is right there neck and neck as one of my favorites in the Old Testament. And, and there's just so much interesting stuff. And so today we're going to jump off at Joshua 5. And uh, we're going to talk about this and see what God might have in store for us. I'm going to read to you, uh, let's go Joshua 5, 1 all the way through, I don't know, the end of 12. Occasionally it's just good to read the Word of God. Here we go. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all of the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. It was at that time that the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and he circumcised the Israelites at Gibbeth Haralot. Now this is why he did so. All those who had come out of Egypt, all of the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All of the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the desert for 40 years until all of the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them, that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way, and after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Verse 9, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have ruled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal on to this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while they camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. Verse 12 says, The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year they ate of the produce of Canaan. That is the word of our God. Well, you may not know this book, but a book by uh, author C.E. Montagu, an author, uh, author who wrote a book called Rough Justice that was a World War I book. Uh, in that book, he, he tells of, of a very memorable scene, and, and he describes of a little boy named Bron. Uh, this little boy goes to church the very first time with his governess, uh, the woman who was responsible for, for taking care of him, for his training, for teaching him. And he watches with interest each and every part of the service. And then at some point the, the preacher climbs into one of those old style high pulpits and Bron hears this man tell some terrible news. It's about a, a brave, kind man who was nailed to a cross, terribly, terribly hurt, a long, long time ago, and who still feels dreadful pain even now because there was something not done that he wants everyone to do. Little Bron thinks that this preacher is telling the story because there's a lot of people there, and he believes somebody is going to do something about it. And so Bron sits there during this worship service, sitting there on the edge of the pew, He can hardly wait to see what the first move is going to be to right this injustice. And as he sits there quietly, he eventually decides, well, maybe after this service, somebody will do something about it. And eventually, this little boy begins to weep because nobody else seems to be upset about it like he is. And in the book, then the story is over and the people walk away as if they had not heard this terrible news, as if nothing remarkable had happened. 
And as Bron leaves the church in the book, he's, he's trembling and his governess looks at him and he says, he says, Bron, she says, Bron, don't, don't take it to heart, little man. Someone will think you are different. Sad, huh? But don't we often do the very same thing ourselves? What, what does different mean? Now, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says distinct, separate, not the same, out of the ordinary, maybe unusual, right? And as I read through the Bible, I see that we as Christians are called to this very thing. God has always desired that his people would be set apart, that they would be different. When the Hebrew people had crossed the Jordan River to occupy the promised land, God marked them through an act called circumcision. God said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israel, Israelite men again in Josh, or Joshua 5.2, as you heard me read. You see, circumcision was an outward sign of inward obedience by the people. It was a physical act wrought with spiritual meaning. It was a very important means of marking their identity as the people of God. It revealed the covenant relationship that God had agreed to have with his people. Joshua was set aside an entire day to perform this. Men who ranged in ages from their 40s all the way down into birth. And we see in the Bible that God was pleased with this. God used this ancient rite to show that his people were consecrated and were dedicated to him. It was his way of marking his people to show that they were holy. Now, throughout scripture, circumcision is used as a metaphor for holiness. Moses complained that he had uncircumcised lips in in Exodus 6.12, by which he meant that his speech was not fit to participate in God's program. Jeremiah spoke of it as in having uncircumcised ears, that his ears were unfit to hear God's word. When Israel entered into the promised land, they were to regard the fruit there as uncircumcised for three years. But the Bible tells us in Leviticus 19.24 that in the fourth year, all of its fruit must be consecrated as a praise offering to the Lord. So Jeremiah issued the call to the men of Judah and Jerusalem in Jeremiah 4.4. He says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskins of your heart. A circumcised heart was a call to a radical spiritual surgery where the spirit was broken and the heart was opened up and the will was then submissive to God. It provided the true identity of God's people. It was a way that they would represent God to the world. Now in the very same way, God calls his people today to holiness. You and me, each and every one of us. A holy person is is not an odd person, but a distinct person. A holy person has a quality about their life that is separate. They present their lifestyle as different from that of the world that surrounds them. They're real. They're genuine. They're authentic. And they represent the likeness of Jesus Christ to a watching world. We're told in 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16, You are to be holy in all conduct, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Yeah, you may have heard this, this paraphrase before. Eugene Peterson wrote a, a paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. And while I wouldn't use it for scholarly study, it sometimes has some very interesting insight. And in it, um, he paraphrases this passage and he says, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life shaped by God's life, a life energetic and blazing with holiness. You see, holiness is to be different. 
And you see, holiness as a Christ follower is not an option. It's mandatory. It is, in fact, what identifies us as followers of Jesus. Now you might say, now wait a minute, right? Someone might say, this holiness thing, pastor, that seems like a little too much for me. I mean, I'll, I'll, I can pray by myself, right? I can do devotions where nobody sees, but man, living, living this way, I don't want people to think I'm different. That is the problem sometimes, isn't it? We don't want people to think we are different. We don't want to be different. Why? Well, first, we value conformity. We don't want to stand out from the crowd, do we? We want to be unique just like everybody else. Right? We wear the same style of clothes. We talk similarly. We conform to the in things. We tend to live in a pretty narrow range of uniqueness. Most people, the unique things about us just aren't, frankly, all that unique. And like bronze governess, what we fear most is to be thought of as being different. We have come from an assembly line society. And we are terrified of being set apart. Another reason that we have for not living a life of holiness is because for some of us, we think holiness, we, when, we, when we think of the word holiness, we think of like monks, right? And priests and missionaries and, and, you know, living in a mud hut in Africa, that must be holiness, right? People who live far, far away, people who have to give up all the fun, people who give up all the frivolities of life, people who've got to trade in their luxury cars, no more comfortable things, no more nice homes, no more well-paying jobs, no more dental plan for the kids, and then basically going and living that Peace Corps life, a stint in a third world country, that's what we think of when we think of holiness, And because we fear that, we say no thank you to holiness. Now before I became a Christian, I really, truly thought that Christians were missing out on a lot of fun things in life. After after I started living my life with Christ, I discovered the very opposite, in fact, was true. As a Christian, I found what I was missing out on was all the stupid things, well, not all of them, but some of the stupid things that I used to do that caused me pain. All of the bad lifestyle choices that I was making that were causing harm and injury to myself and the others around me. Holiness means we think differently as well. Being different means thinking different. To be different begins with a proper preparation of our minds. In other words, as Christ followers, we are to take the initiative in preparing our minds for the life of holiness. Behavioral science has shown time and time again that human behavior is determined to a very great extent by our subconscious mind. You see this a lot in conflict. I see it as pastor when I counsel people in conflict all the time. We respond to the ways that we learn to respond often in childhood. And we bring that into our relationship. And sometimes that creates friction, right? And it's in our subconscious. We don't necessarily choose to respond that way. We just learned it. But if we learned it once, we can unlearn it and learn a new way. So we have to choose, we have to prepare our minds to begin to make choices to move in the direction of holiness. Our minds must be prepared. If we want to be holy, we have to choose to be holy. And we have to choose to walk down that path time and time again. Proverbs 23, 7 says this, For as he thinks within himself, so he is. 
the Apostle Paul warns us not to let the world squeeze us into its mold, right? He says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might discern what is good, what is pleasing, and what is perfect to the will of God. Romans 12.2 Being called holy means that we live differently. 1 Peter 1.17 says this. It says, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners or as aliens here in reverent fear. You see, a natural consequence of our right thinking as we begin to transform our minds a natural consequence of right thinking is right living. As we change the way we think, we will change in how we live. When we begin to think differently, we begin to live differently. That makes a lot of sense, right? But it takes an intentional choice. We are called as Christ followers to live a life that people notice for its distinctiveness. A life that represents him. How many of you know, I bet you most, Henry David Thoreau, right? You probably read his poems in high school back in the day. Well, you may not know some of his backstory, but once upon a time, Henry David Thoreau chose to go to jail rather than pay a state poll tax in a state that was a slave-supporting state. He objected. And so the choices were pay the poll tax or go to jail. So he chooses to go to jail, and it's during that time, if you've ever read the essay, he wrote an essay called Civil Disobedience. It's uh, an essay that's famous the world over, one of his more popular works. Now, while Thoreau is sitting in this jail, his good friend Ralph Ralph Waldo Emerson, who you've probably heard of as well, Emerson comes to visit him. He hurries to jail to find out, why are you in jail? And so, so Emerson shows up at the jail and he peers through the bars and Thoreau is sitting there and, and Emerson says, why Henry, what are you doing in there? The unfazed Thoreau looks at him and he says, no, Ralph, the question is, what are you doing out there? Who is the different one? Who is the different one, Braun or his governess? Thoreau or Emerson? The one in jail or the rest of us outside of jail? Thoreau was not a a, a church-going man because he thought the churches of his day were too tradition-bound. And perhaps he was right. That's not my point today. Yet in his book, Walden, he speaks often of God. He explains that he went to Walden Pond to live the simple life because he wanted to get just those answers that we all seek. He says, I went into the woods because I wished to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, have discovered that I had not lived. In another place, uh, in another time, Thoreau commented, if a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it's because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music in which he hears, however measured or far away it might be. You see, the holy person has to have the courage to live differently because they are marching to the drumbeat of a different drummer, that of Jesus Christ. And they are not afraid to be out of step with the rest of the world. That is what we are called to. Now once we begin to think differently, and then that translates itself into our living differently, then we have to love differently, folks. Love sets us apart. Love is the display of holiness. Love is the litmus test for Christianity. And it's not just any kind of love. It's a sincere love. It is genuine and authentic. Like God's love for us. Our motive is never to get something in return, but only simply 
to give that love that we were first given. It is a deep, it is a rich, it is an abiding love. It is an intense love. It is fervent. It is a love to be given with all of our strength. It is a pure love, a spotless and clean love. Create in me a clean heart, O God, a pure heart that I might love you and love others in your name. This is the kind of love that Jesus talked about when he said, by this, all the people will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one another. Find that in the book of John thirteen thirty five. Love one another sincerely, deeply, purely. And people will know as you do that that you are different. There will be no mistaking it. And they will know as you do that that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Now as we begin to think differently, that leads to our living differently, which leads to our loving differently, right? This then leads us to talking differently. You see, the words that we use reveal, most obviously, who we are, whether we are different or not. We live in a world that uses words to put people down and to tear people up. God followers are to use their words to build people up, to restore, and to strengthen. Words words have the power to edify, to give life, but too often we use them to mortify and bring death. Have you ever stolen somebody else's joy? with your words or or killed somebody's self-esteem with something that you said? It's so easy to do and so difficult to undo. You know that's true. Every one of us carries a hurt, a harm, a word said to us probably all the way back into childhood. Some girl said something about you on the playground and you're still mad at her about it. And we laugh, but we know it's true. Some coach said something. Maybe your dad. Or maybe your mom had that way to kind of dig in. And you carry those burdens, those hurts, those harms, those wounds. First, forgive. It's hurting nobody but you. But second, choose to move forward in such a way that you will not repeat, that you will not do that, that you will not propagate the pain and suffering because of your words in others. The world has a desperate need for people who are different. For people that have a mark about their lives that sets them apart. We need people who will be Jesus followers at the office, in Congress, in society, in classrooms, at the bank, at the grocery store, wherever they go. We need people who will be different. People who will live with a a vibrant faith, even though the rest of society thinks differently. And you cannot have that kind of faith without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the one that is pounding the drum, the drumbeat of a different drummer, a calling to live differently in this world. He is the one that calls us to stand out from the crowd, to be distinct to be separate, to be unusual, and to be okay with it. Jesus calls us to be different. The question is, do you dare to be different? We can sit there, just like bronze governess, and walk out having heard the message and just say, oh, Bron, 
You don't want people to think you're different. Or we can take it to heart. We can choose to think differently, live differently, love differently, and speak differently. And if we choose to do that, and we're not going to be perfect, but if we choose to do that, and we choose every day to do that, and we keep trying to do that, and each and every day we try to get better at that, and we hold one another accountable to if we keep working at that, we can change the world. I want you to change the world. Do you dare to be different? Let's pray.